Hi, and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. Today, I wanted to tear apart the sky. Let me see if I can get it to focus. Eh, we'll take a closer look at it, but this is the this is the guy we're tearing apart. Uh, for the uninitiated, for people who don't generally mess around with industrial type equipment, this is a line monitoring or power quality relay. And uh, let's do just a little bit of background before we tear this thing apart so we understand what it does and how it does it. To really begin our discussion, uh, we have to do a little bit of background on AC. AC stands for alternating current, and that is the power that you have in your house coming out of the walls. That's what your lights turn on with, etc. As compared to DC, which is direct current, uh, the current in DC always flows in one direction and in one direction only. With AC, the uh, voltage and current will constantly flip-flop back and forth. If you live in the US or most of the Americas, that tends to happen at 60 times per second. Uh, Europe, Australia, and I think China, that tends to happen 50 times per second. Uh, the reasons for that are more historical than anything else, but what we're interested in looking at is the waveform of the uh, alternating current voltage, which happens over time. And effectively, we have time uh, that's moving this way on this graph, and then you have positive voltage up here, and then you have negative voltage down here. And so this wave will, generally the way we draw it, is it starts at zero, and then goes up, and then comes back down, it crosses zero, comes down to negative, and then back up to zero. Uh, if you live in the U.S., uh, this tends to be uh, 120 volts RMS, and that RMS part is commonly left off, and people will just say it's 120 volts. <clears throat> well, 120 volts RMS represents a voltage level that's something like here. Kind of like that, because on a 120 volt RMS waveform, the peak voltage, meaning the voltage from here to here, is 170 volts peak. I don't want to spend a whole lot about this. You know, um, if you're curious, I can always do uh, more videos on AC and really get into the nitty gritty of it, what we're more so interested in are the different setups. And I'm only showing you what a household setup looks like for the purposes of to try and understand what industrial setup look like, which we'll talk about here shortly. So also in your house, when you have an outlet, you uh, the outlet will have two or three wires. And so one, wire is going to be the hot, one wire is going to be the neutral, and then if you have a third wire, the third wire is going to be ground, but I like to refer to it as earth because ground has a tendency to be overused because you can have something that has multiple grounds and some of those grounds are grounds and some of those grounds are earths and it gets very confusing. So. Uh, Instead of ground like uh, people tend to look at it, let's, say, let's call this earth. Because earth is very unambiguous, it's earth will go to a pole that is hammered into the ground outside and or tied to the cold water pipes that are coming into your house. And so earth is earth, but ground is not necessarily earth, and so it eliminates a lot of the ambiguity. Earth, like that. And so what happens is that uh, the voltage between the hot and the neutral, if you measure from this point to this point, will look like this. And that gives you 120 volts RMS. Now, uh, again, if you're in the US, uh, uh, 
and uh, you are running a, a 240 volt appliance, like for example, a uh, clothes dryer or an electric stove, what you can have is you can have a second hot coming into that outlet and the voltage across hot to hot now becomes uh, 240 volts but the voltage from any hot to a neutral and i don't want to muck that up but anyway it's kind of like from here to here becomes 120 volts and uh, this type of setup has to do with the transformer that's on the on the pole outside or you know sitting on the ground again it really depends on where you live how utilities and stuff are wired around you but the idea behind these two hots is these two hots are 120 so not 120 180 degrees out of phase what does that mean and so if we let's call those hot one and hot two if hot one is represented by this waveform right here if we were to measure hot two at the same time hot two goes exactly the opposite way from hot one that so if something is connected across uh, hot one and hot two it's, you know, and we measured it, let's say here, the reference point is here and the measurement point is here. So now instead of going from zero, which is neutral, and I meant to mention this, I think I forgot, earth and neutral tend to be tied together in the electrical panel of your house. It does not mean that earth and neutral are interchangeable because they serve different functions, but they are tied together. So if you kind of follow the neutral, all the way back to the electrical box and the earth all the way back to the electrical box they will be sitting attached to the same rail and that same rail is attached to the neutral line that comes out of the transformer and that same line goes outside and gets hammered into the ground but anyway so when you measure between hot to hot you end up getting 240 volts rms instead of 120 volts. And so keep this setup in mind and we're, we'll start talking about an industrial setup. Industrial setups will use something called three phase power. Uh, the uh, power we just looked at from your house will be considered either one or two phase power because one phase meaning that you have a phase and a neutral and two phase meaning you have the two phases which was hot one and hot two but for industrial purposes industrial likes to use three phase power the reason for three phase power is three phase power delivers power very smoothly uh, as we'll look at here in a second the waveform for three phase power doesn't have these like pinched off points like two phase power or one phase power does because uh, the waveform always has to cross zero and at these zero points no power is actually being delivered and so uh, you're dependent on storage devices like momentum or capacitors or other messy yucky things that we don't want to get into right now to make sure that the power is delivered smoothly but in three phase power three phases working together can smoothly deliver power and there's never kind of dips in the power. And so the waveform for three phase power at the first looks exactly the same. You have that same sinusoidal type waveform that you had before. But this is only the first phase. The second phase is now 120 degrees out of phase instead of 180 degrees out of phase. And so if we take this and divide it into three roughly even sections do, do, do. let me kind of eyeball it like that uh, the waveform now instead of starting here like we did with a uh, two-phase power it starts back a little bit so now the waveform comes up this way um, do, do, do. 
Sorry, trying to draw this freehand kind of sucks. And it comes down this way, and then over here, it's kind of doing this. <clears throat> and then the uh, third waveform, the third phase, would kind of start here. Go this way. Try to do that. <clears throat> I know this is ends up being very very confusing, but the way you can look at it is uh, in industrial type stuff. The power is usually leveled L1, L2, L3, and so the peak here is L1, the peak here is L2, and the peak here is L3. And notice how if you kind of follow the peaks along you never reach the zero point here because the crossover between L1 and L2 ends up being above the zero point. And so this allows you to very smoothly deliver power, particular to things like uh, large uh, industrial electric motors. So now that we've gotten that little introduction out of the way, so what does a power quality relay actually do? So what this really does is it monitors the three phases, L1, L2, and L3, and it controls a set of contacts. Those contacts generally will run some sort of large contactor uh, in the machine, whatever that industrial machine happens to be, and they will only allow the power to go past that uh, contactor, meaning to power everything else in the machine, if the power is good. What does it mean if the power is good? It means that all three phases are present. Uh, the voltage of all three phases is neither too high nor too low. And that's both in reference to each other and to ground. That uh, the uh, uh, symmetry of the phases is correct, meaning that uh, they're not the shape of the sine waves is not all contorted. Um, and if the phases are in the correct order, meaning that whenever you connect things, that you connect L1 to L1, L2 to L2, and L3 to L3, versus L1 to L1, L3 to L2, and L2 to L3, that you can get the phases out of order. Now the purpose of a power quality relay to check all this is twofold. First of all, safety. Safety, 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 safety. Why? Well, uh, if you swap L2 and L3 on a three-phase motor, the motor will start to spin backwards. And when the motor spins backwards, that can hurt people because if the machine starts driving backwards or doing something backwards that you weren't expecting, somebody can get hurt. Uh, also, uh, they do it to protect the machine itself because, for instance, if the machine starts to spin backwards, uh, it will break itself and we don't want the machine to break itself. And so if, for instance, the power quality really detects that L2 and L3 are switched, uh, the relay will shut the machine down and not let you operate it until something is fixed. Now, besides the obvious question that, well, hey, I have this large machine. It's, you know, it's the size of a small building. It's sitting in my warehouse. It's been hooked up for years, you know, and running correctly. Why do I need a power quality relay? Well, uh, having your phases swapped is only one thing that it monitors. For example, let's say you have a transformer outside and the transformer blows unbeknownst to you. Well, you could have a phase that let's say L2 goes missing and now the machine's not going to run correctly. And so a missing phase will shut you down. <clears throat> uh, and uh, this is in reference to large stationary equipment. You also have lots of industrial equipment that's portable, meaning that you have something that's on wheels and you have a big connector on it and you walk over, <coughs> plug it into the wall. Well, if you've ever dealt with facility power, particularly at very large facilities, there's no guarantee that that facility power 
A is functional, so you could be missing a phase. B, you could have a voltage that's too low for the machine to function because this particular outlet is all the way on the other side of the building and we never use it up until now, so we've actually never checked it. Oops. Or the outlets may actually be wired differently throughout the facility, meaning that you have the same plug but depending on where you plug it in, sometimes the phases are in order and sometimes the phases are out of order and that will shut you down. And so this is, those are the two kind of applications that this relay is really good for, that if something is wrong with the power that's coming in, the relay will shut you down. And so now that we've gone through this kind of basic introduction, let's go ahead and pop this guy open and see what it looks like on the inside. This is what the relay looks like up close. This relay is made by PILS, P-L-I-Z. This is a very respectable brand. And uh, this relay was actually changed out only because its voltage no longer suited the <coughs> uh, particular application it was being used for. If we look on the side here, uh, this voltage is rated 400, 440 volts AC. And uh, the application changed, which needed to go as high as 500 volts AC. And so obviously this relay wouldn't work anymore. Uh, this relay is the th uh, S3UM and it is powered by 24 volts DC. And so um, let's go over that for a little bit to uh, get a little better understanding of what these two actually mean. On the front of the relay here, you will see L1, L2, L3, Y1, Y2, Y3, A1, A2, N, 11, 12, 14. What does that mean? So as I mentioned, uh, previously, L1, L2, L3 are your three phases that are coming in. And so if we kind of look at the relay here at an angle, you can put wires in here and you can put wires in here. So L1, L2, L3 refer to those three lower wire holes. Y1, Y2, Y3 refer to these upper three wire holes. And those same wire holes you can see over on this side, which this is probably a good point to mention because you can see them pretty well. Uh, these little clippies, I don't know what you want to call them down here, that if we put a screwdriver in here and we twist it, you can see that opening will close like that. And if you had a wire in there, now that wire would be squished on both sides by that clip. And when we want to remove the relay, we just spin the screwdriver in the opposite direction. And you can see that opening will open back up, releasing the wire. And so back to what we were saying. So L1, L2, L3 are our three wires that we're going to be sensing and they're going to be in these three wire holes here. Now, some setups will also have a neutral wire. And if you have a neutral wire, the neutral wire goes here for N, but the neutral wire for this particular relay is optional. Now, Y1, Y2, Y3 deal with two things. Uh, Y1 and Y2 uh, deal with reset. What does that mean? As you can see down here, you have MRAR and MIAR stand for manual reset and automatic reset. Uh, currently, this relay is an automatic reset, meaning that whenever the power quality on L1, L2, L3 is good, the relay will automatically switch to on or off. It's, it depends on how this is set, whether it's normally open, normally closed, but the relay will automatically transition from one state to the other state. If you have manual reset, which would be this pushed up, the relay has to see a connection, a, 
momentary connection between Y1 and Y2 to let you to let the relay know that is okay. It's okay to transition from the faulted state to the not faulted state. And so if you tie these two together momentarily with a, like a push button, and this is going to be done separately somewhere outside, you know, on the outside of the equipment that uh, when uh, you tie these two together, you know, it would be the reset button that you would press. Now, if you tie Y3 to Y2, uh, this gives the thing a little bit more headroom. So, you know, it's, well, normally it's 400 volts, but if you tie Y2 and Y3 together, now it becomes 440 volts. And that's the only reason there. So on the bottom here, we already talked about our neutral. A1 and A2 are our power source, whereas you're allowed to put 400 volts on these terminals up here. The actual power for inside of the relay is A1 and A2, and you can put 24 volts DC, like it's stated right here, 24 volts DC into A1 and A2. And finally, we get to 11, 12, and 14. These are the uh, internal relay contacts. And what they do is 11 is common, and then 12 and 14 are your normally open, normally closed, but I can never remember which one is which. Sometimes they give you a little cheat sheet right here, but apparently this time they didn't, so I still don't know which one is, because one is gonna be, I wanna say I think 11 is the common, 12 is the normally closed, and 14 is the normally open. And uh, what this switch does right here is when you switch it one way, uh, this relay is normally open. And when you switch it the other way, this relay is normally closed and basically it modifies what are, what's the faulted state and what's the not faulted state for when the relay has power. <clears throat> also on the front panel here, as you can see, is that these right here are your uh, voltage levels. So this one right here is your over voltage. And so if we can turn this little arrow, well, it's kind of hard to do with tweezers, but anyway, you can turn this arrow and you can select whether you want your over voltage to be 100%, meaning that if you exceed the, let's say 400 volts, immediately um, the relay will detect a fault. Or you can go as high as 120%, which would be, I think, 480, and the relay still won't care. And similar to the under voltage, you can have a 100%, or you can have 90%, 80%, 75%. And then finally, you have the time. What the time is, the time uh, will dictate how long the relay will wait to trip from e any of the conditions um, before actually uh, opening, you know, transitioning these contacts from the not faulted state to the faulted state. And so you can select from a half second to 10 seconds. The reason for this time delay type feature is that let's say you have a large industrial motor that's starting up and that motor can draw some extra juice. And while that motor is starting up, which startup for motor tends to be its highest, its peak type um, uh, consumption, the voltage can droop a little bit. And so if we set our under voltage to 90, but our voltage will actually droop to 80% below, you know, 80% of uh, the set voltage, you can say that, okay, I want to set my uh, time to five seconds because the motor would have already spun up by that point in time. And so um, I can avoid the trip by delaying my trip to five seconds because my voltage levels would already have come up by that point in time. What I absolutely hate about this really is that it has two lights. It has power, which, okay, whatever. We know that you're powered, meaning you have 24 volts sitting here, and you have fault. The single fault light is the stupidest thing on the face of this planet because from this one light, you know the relay's faulted, but why? Are we missing a phase? Um, 
do we have an asymmetry problem? <clears throat> is the voltage too low? Is the voltage too high? There, there's so many questions that you can't answer just off of one light that says I'm faulted. Something's wrong, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've worked with other power quality relays, like Siemens, for example, makes one that's got a little screen on it. And that little screen gives you a readout of, well, what's my voltage, what's my fault, etc. where just by glancing at the screen, you know exactly why the relay's faulted and you can go hunt for the problem versus having to figure out what the problem is just from one single stupid light. Otherwise, for other than this one light issue, this relay works just fine. Another industrial type thing to note about this relay is this relay is designed to be DIN rail mounted. So there is a rail that's got wings on it here and here. And this relay then will clip onto the one wing. And then as you rock it over, this part is sort of spring loaded. Let's see if we can get a better picture of it like that. And this will clip over the other wing and now the relay will be mounted vertically kind of like this, sitting on those clips. And if you want to remove the relay, you take a screwdriver, you stick it underneath here, you pull down on this clip, which releases it here and the relay pops off. The case of the relay is actually only held closed by these two clips here and these two clips here should be fairly easily defeated. But as you can kind of see, there's kind of a crack in there. So most likely I will break them as I take this apart. There we go. I think that's undone and well, back side of the board. So the front side of the board is here. And nicely enough, it just pulls out and here is our board. And let's go ahead and jump over into kind of a macro look so we can get a better look at all of the parts and pieces. Now, the first thing I wanted to take a look at is show you how the dials on the front here actually interface with the board. And it's kind of curious because if you look down in here, let's see if we'll focus, there are these rods that pass from the front down into the potentiometers that are on the board. And if we slide the board over here, there are these three potentiometers that if we kind of stick something in there, we should be able to, should, there we go, be able to rotate them. And that's how that's done from the front panel. And our two switches here, uh, <clears throat> you can access through the front panel. Now moving on, if the board was oriented this way, these connections here are our L1, L2, L3 connections. And as you can see, right in this area, there's not a whole lot on this board and everything is kind of keeping away. And the reason for that is because this is high voltage. And so if we look at our uh, traces here, we have three that one comes around this way, one this way, one this way, and all three of these lead to these three resistors here. And um, if you want to, you can look up what the band colors here are. I don't have the band colors memorized, but these band colors are most likely a fairly high value resistor because these resistors are protecting the front end from damage, basically from high currents. Because if you're missing a phase, you can get an imbalance in here and these resistors will protect the front end over here from high current flows. Because if one phase is, let's say, you know, a 50% of the other two, you can get a high current flow that goes from the two phases down to the middle one. And these resistors will prevent that from happening. Now down here, 
you can see, let me see if I can get the whole thing in the shot here, three nearly identical setups. One, two, three. And most likely these are what's actually reading them. And sorry, I have them upside down. Let me get them right side up for you. This looks like an ST part. And we will look up what this ST part here is in a minute. But most likely uh, each one of these is reading one of the three phases separately. And then all of this is fed into probably a microcontroller which it may be this guy, but I don't think so. 2902, 2902, 2902. This looks like to be a separate um, <clears throat> part. It might be that guy, but said we will look around. I don't readily recognize that symbol. Um, this guy here it looks like is going to be your DC to DC converter. It's fairly common to have just a, a <coughs> excuse me, uh, DC to DC converter that's just rolled into a package. And so um, this DC to DC will power the 3.3 or 5 volt side of all of this microcontroller, etc. You know, it's it's a distinct possibility this may be purely analog, but that that makes me wonder. So now the relay portion of it is actually this guy here. And you have your coil, which let's see here 10 amps 30 volts DC, 250 volts AC. Let's see, will it tell me what the Coil rating is one of the time. I don't outright see the rating of the coil. Maybe somebody's probably yelling at me like it's this over here. Uh, it's probably volt AC. I think it might be 30 volts <coughs> uh, DC. And so if this thing is powered by 24 volts, which the uh, relay stuff is right here and if we flip it over we should see super fat traces that go from the pins back here to one to the other and this guy here probably goes off to the third one yeah here it is right here to the relay and so the relay now can control something over this way so for all of those people that were actually yelling the coil is 18 volts DC. It was right in front of me. I was trying to find it up here. These are the ratings of the contacts themselves, but the coil is 18 volts DC. Also, if you look at the chips here, I don't know what I was uh, smoking when I said this, but 2902 is the date code when this was manufactured. So this is the 29th week of 2002 and the chip is a 9PM450. So if we look over here, and it's a lot more difficult to see because whatever, for whatever reason, the numbers over here are almost not visible, but this is also a 9PM450. And I have scoured the internet for these ST parts, which that's clearly ST uh, semiconductor right here, but nothing, no matter how I type these 9 PM 450 numbers in, I can't find anything on these at all. And just by inferring that we have three of these one, two, three, and then there is a fourth one over here that most likely this is an analog based type of solution because if you had a digital based solution, meaning you had a microcontroller, there would be some fourth chip somewhere, which I also do not think it's you either. And I couldn't find anything on this guy as well, which if anybody is aware of what these chips are, you know, please um, put something down in the comments below. But 
just kind of from inferring what's going on here, it's that it seems like this is an analog solution that these three chips are going to be sensing our three inputs and uh, most likely maybe a, a comparator. Uh, I don't think that this, this is going to be any kind of ADC because like I said, these are most likely analog parts, uh, maybe like a, a true RMS filter or, you know, sensing chip, something like that, which gives you some sort of an output that possibly this guy is some sort of comparator. And, you know, if one of these drops off, it will disconnect your output. Because if, uh, let's see here, just for the sake of posterity, Let's see here. So these two contacts are going to be the coil of this chip and just kind of vaguely see where that goes off to. So this comes over here. Which is some sort of protection zener or something along those lines. And then this trace runs over to that most likely a transistor. And then from here, it looks like stuff runs. So you can kind of follow the strays to here and sort of to here, to here, and then to this guy. So it's possible that this is some sort of a comparator, maybe a gate, like a three input and gate or something along those lines where if any one of these goes, I have a problem, this will go, well, you know, two are ones and one is a zero and on a three input and gate if any one of the things is a zero it drops to zero and the coil opens something along those lines and then the question is what's this guy then because it's it doesn't look like it's getting anything from the input at all you know, possibly this is receiving something from over here, but it, it, it's very odd that all four chips are exactly the same chip. And so it, it still makes me think it's an analog solution because you wouldn't have three microcontrollers and then the fourth microcontroller. So that doesn't make sense. You could have three, uh, you know, input front endy things and then the fourth one would be the micro and it would be a completely different chip not four chips that are the same so maybe this is doing also some sort of comparison or testing that these you know all of this is working as like a input filter inputty front end type thing that conditions all the signals for this but then the outputs of these are then somehow checked by this guy maybe it's, it's very difficult to say without knowing what these chips actually are. The other thing this answers is, is if we assume that this is an analog -y type, oops, analog -y type device, then it makes sense why you have a power light and an error light because, ooh, actually maybe, maybe this lights up, maybe this is responsible for the error light that the air light comes on whenever you know something trips but anyway uh this explain why there's only one light that says i have an error because the analogy type stuff without having like multiple lights or different colors or something like that wouldn't be able to tell you on like a digital screen that says you know phase a voltage is too low or my um um well, what can I think of what it's called now? Why my uh, uh, voltage pattern is all distorted or something like that, or, you know, all the collective voltage is too low or what I tripped on, etc. An analog circuit wouldn't be able to tell you that just through a single light. So maybe multiple lights, you know, maybe that's something pills could have done is to have like three lights here besides the power light that are like my voltage too low or my voltage too high. 
or I have, you know, exceeded my asymmetry. That's the word I was looking for, asymmetry. You know, where the, the sinusoids are distorted or something like that. But just this one light bothers me so much because you just, you can't tell what, well, you know, what's wrong with you? Well, there's something wrong. Well, you know, you can check your three phases and go, you know, oh, I'm missing a phase, but for like, let's say a, an asymmetry issue, ugh, you know, good luck finding that one without breaking out an oscilloscope. Whereas something that has a digital screen on it that will just say, hey, I have an asymmetry issue and that's why I'm off. You know, it's so much nicer to diagnose with without having to try and, you know, probe a bunch of stuff that and so, you know, that's really it. That I wish I could have found out what this chip is. And I reiterate that if you know what this chip is, you know, please leave me a comment so I can look it up. But that's really about everything that we can look on here. I hope that was an interesting look into a piece of industrial equipment. Uh, unless you're in the field that works with modules like this that snap onto a DIN rail and this is common for you, you normally wouldn't see stuff like this. And so that I hope that this was an interesting look into what this kind of stuff looks like. As I said, I wish I knew what these chips were, but as I said, no amount of Googling was bringing anything up. You know, looking on ST's website wasn't really revealing anything. It's possible that Pills actually buys enough of these that they can get their own part number put on these. And to, there's a, a very large variety of devices like these, these line monitoring or poly, uh, power quality relays out there and so it's very possible that pills you know buys just a shit ton of these and so, so they can afford to ask st to go hey can you put our own part number on there so with a lot more effort i probably could find a pin compatible package and try and figure out what pins are which etc but for you know for something like this that is a tremendous amount of effort which to, if one of you want, you know, somebody out there wants to figure that out, go for it. But for the purposes of this video, I think that would be going entirely too far. I hope that you enjoyed the video. So if you like the video, you're, you know, please give it a thumbs up. That always helps. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, you know, you're welcome to put them down below. Thank you for watching.